Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jennifer Jackson. I'm a registered nurse and um, I am an assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary. And in this video, we're going to be talking about methodologies in qualitative research. So this is part two to our discussion of qualitative research. And in um, talking about methodologies, we're looking at several main types of qualitative research. And when you're praising qualitative papers, we want to think about what you're expecting to find in different types of studies. So for example, if you walk into a fast food restaurant, you have an idea of what's going to happen. You know, you walk up, there's a menu, you look and you tell the person what you would like. When you walk into, say, a fine dining restaurant, you are brought to a seat, you're given a menu, you choose what you would like to eat, it's prepared for you, it takes longer. It, it's a very different experience. And so, you know, when you walk into a restaurant, you tend to have an idea of what kind of experience you're going to get based on what type of research or what type of restaurant you're talking about. And it applies the same way with our research. Based on the type of study we have, we have some general ideas about what types of things we might expect to see there. And so when you're appraising your research, you want to think about what would we normally expect to see? And does this study line up fairly closely with those expectations? So the main um, examples we'll be talking about today are phenomenology, grounded theory, ethnography, and interpretive description. These are certainly not the only types of qualitative research, but these are the main ones that you will see. And these are the ones you're going to have an opportunity to appraise as part of this course. So these questions or these methods all answer different kinds of questions. So phenomenology addresses experience. So you want to see what is the main essence of a phenomenon. What is the golden nugget of this person's experience? So we're understanding experience when we look at phenomenology. So we might ask, how has um, someone's life changed? How do they see themselves now that they've been through this? What were the standout emotions that they went through? Um, how might we understand how these people go through something and then, or what this experience was like, and then what, from there we can formulate a nursing response. So for example, um, here's a phenomenological study of nurses humor. So we can see when we first look at this visual, we can see there's different elements but they do not appear to be directly connected together. So they're in a cluster together, showing that they're related, but there's no, for example, there's no lines going from one to another, and there aren't, you know, numbered in a particular sequence or something. Like we don't have one, then two, then three, then four. So this study was looking at how nurses use humor, and it they found that there were kind of five different ideas that were part of the nursing experience of humor. So humor could enhance therapeutic communication and building relationships with patients. It could help to diffuse or deal with difficult situations. Um, humor had both an immediate effect, but it also could have a lasting effect. It created a sense of cohesiveness among staff and among nurses and patients. And humor could be planned or spontaneous. So it could be something you were expecting or it could kind of come from nowhere. So this study tells us all of these different important things about humor. And from there, we can formulate a response based on our understanding of humor. So here, nurses' experiences of humor um, were that it helped to enhance a sense of cohesiveness among a team. 
So if we need to enhance teams, we could say what type of humor might be appropriate in this environment. Is there something we can do to foster that type of humor? Um, and that's an example of how we can take what we found and think about how it applies to practice. So if we were at a glance, we're appraising a phenomenological study, we want to make sure, are they talking about experience? Because that is what phenomenology does. It looks at the experience of something. And when we get the findings, we should have a few key different ideas that tell us about that experience. But those ideas are not necessarily in order or directly influencing one another. They're main characteristics of what that experience is like. So that gives you some, some high level ideas of what you should be looking for in a phenomenological study. The usual method for phenomenology is interviews because you are talking to an individual person. It's usually not focus groups unless you're talking to a family unit or, or a couple. It's usually just one person and you're speaking with them about what was this experience like for you and tell me about this experience. So if you're appraising a phenomenological study, you want to check that, that the findings line up with what you're thinking and also that it's you're asking those types of questions about experience. So when we look at our next method, grounded theory. So grounded theory studies process. So while phenomenology studied experience, grounded theory studies process. So how do things happen? What is the process of going through something? So you ultimately do produce a theory that this is different than quantitative research where you test a theory. Here, you're starting from scratch and you want to build a theory. So uh, grounded theory has direction. You're going to have something that probably looks like A, then B, then C. So this is different from phenomenology because one piece directly influences another piece. So this tells you a little something different about um, about a process rather than looking at kind of a constellation of ideas around an experience. So the thing that separates grounded theory from other methods is predictive capacity. And that is the golden nugget of grounded theory research. So what predictive capacity is, is that if I know what you are experiencing now, I could possibly predict how the rest of your experience may go. Because of that, I can then intervene to try and improve that experience. So grounded theory can very, be a very powerful tool, especially in health service research to say, how can we make this process happen more smoothly or in a more positive way? So this is a grounded theory that I created. Um, I know this diagram is not the most beautiful in the world, but it took me a really long time. So I'm taking the opportunity to show it here. So um, this is a grounded theory of nurses resilience. So initially, the first thing that starts this grounded theory that starts this process is someone experiences workplace adversity. So if you don't have workplace adversity, you're not talking about resilience, you're talking about something else. So first they have to experience adversity. Then the driver of the process is having awareness or situational awareness about that adversity. So if someone understands how they are being impacted by the adversity, they can then take steps to make positive decisions for themselves. However, if they don't have that awareness, they are going to end up burnt out. So what this means is, for example, if you say, you know what, I'm really stressed out, I need to take some time away from school, I need to take some time off work. 
I'm going to talk to my friends. I'm maybe going to have some counseling. I'm going to take part in some activities I really like. And I'm going to try and process everything that has happened to me. That is, is different than somebody who says, you know what, I'm fine. I'm just going to keep going. There's no problem here. I'll figure it out. That person then isn't able to use those techniques that can help them and they're going to end up burnt out. So where we see the predictive capacity is that based on whether someone has awareness or not, if they're in the yellow block, I can tell you likely what where they would end up at the end, depending on where they're at, at that kind of yellow block point in time. Now, this doesn't mean I have a crystal ball, I'm not a mind reader, you know, life is complicated, but generally, you can find patterns that all the people I talked to who didn't have awareness, they ended up burnt out. And so one thing we can do to prevent burnout is to try and foster awareness so that then people can move from the yellow to the pink onto managing exposure. And then they can hopefully have um, good indicators and a positive experience at the outset. So grounded theory is about a process the ideas you come up with are connected and they show usually how something goes across time. And this also gives you an element of predictive capacity. And the predictive capacity is what sets grounded theory apart from other methods in qualitative research. Our next example is ethnography. So ethnography in studies culture. So phenomenology studies experience. Grounded theory studies process. Ethnography studies culture. So ethnography essentially answers the question, what is it like here? So it's not about looking at one individual person, it's about the whole system. What is the culture of this place? So classic grounded theory started when um, kind of white colonizers would go to an indigenous community in the Amazon and say, what is the culture of this community? And so um, initially ethnography was quite fraught because of some of those cultural, colonial, imperial implications. But now, often it's used in a really constructive and very different type of way. So for example, maybe we have a nursing uh, unit where the care is really, really good and there are no patients there who have had a pressure ulcer in the past two years. So someone could go and say, I want to do an ethnography there to understand what the culture is like such that they have not had a patient with a pressure ulcer for two years. What are they doing as a community, as a group that is creating these kinds of outcomes? So culture can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. It might be the culture of a society. It might be the culture of a classroom. But culture is the main thing that you're going for. So both grounded theory and phenomenology focus on interviews and they use interviews and speaking with people to come up with their findings. In ethnography, you generally use observation. So that could be participant observation where you are right in there. Um, as one of my former professors said, if you are a participant observationist, if you're doing participant observation, um, you know, if the people you are working with are um, stealing spray paint, graffitiing by the railway tracks, you steal some spray paint and graffiti by the railway tracks. Now, I'm not endorsing stealing or graffiti. I'm just saying sometimes people do things so that they can understand culture. And as a participant, you're actively taking part to see how you feel while you're doing the thing. Non-participant observation might be somebody who is um, who is observing. So you might want to see what is it like at a busy intersection. So you kind of pull up a chair, sit there, and watch. You don't try to influence what is happening in that space. You 
observe and try and make your presence as um, minimal as possible. So you can see that there might be times where people know they're being watched and therefore their behavior changes. Um, other times, so there in that case, you might want to have more of a non-participant role. Other times you wanna be really engaged. And so then participant observation might be more appropriate. So when you're reading an ethnography study, you'll usually see um, one of those two types talked about. And you can also have ethnography that has a different focus. So you could be looking, something like focused ethnography looks at say a particular unit in a hospital or um, a street in a neighborhood. An institutional ethnography looks at exactly as it says, an institution. So that might look at the University of Calgary or um, Foothills Hospital. It might be more broad than a specific geographic space. It might be um, an idea of a space. You can also have meta-ethnography, which looks across multiple ethnographies to see um, what is a bigger picture or contrasts and compares different cultures. Um, you can even have ethnography of digital spaces. There have been people who have done ethnographies of World of Warcraft or, um, you know, Reddit, something like that. So any place where you have people who are mixing together and creating culture, that is a place where you can do ethnography. So participant or observation is the hallmark of ethnographic research. But you can also have interviews, you can look at documents, and you can use your own personal reflections as well. So if you are appraising an ethnographic study, you need to make sure that there's some discussion of observation, there's other discussions of um, the types of materials that were used as data, but above all, it's looking at culture and what is it like here. So a great example of an ethnography is Davina Allen's work. And um, the study was actually written up in a book and this book changed my life. I strongly recommend that you consider um, buying and reading it. I know that an extra academic book is maybe not the top of everyone's list, but this, is, this work is so important. It's absolutely transformational in nursing. So Davina Allen is a sociologist and she watched nurses work and she created the concept of organizational labor, which was so transformative because often nurses would um, say that, oh, the paperwork is taking me away from the bedside and the bedside is where I do real work and paperwork or phone calls or meeting with other people healthcare professionals. This is just stuff that gets in the way. This is not my real job. My real job is patient care. However, Davina Allen showed that nurses spend a huge proportion of their time doing this organizational labor. And she makes a convincing argument that if you do not have good organizational labor, the healthcare system will grind to a halt. So maybe your paperwork for that day is that you have to write a discharge summary. But if that discharge summary is badly done, then when that patient goes home, they may not get all the care they need. And that might set the home care nurse up to fail because that transfer from the hospital setting to the home doesn't go smoothly. So then the patient might do poorly and have to be readmitted because um, the discharge didn't go well. So you can see that, yeah, it's a piece of paper where you write a discharge summary, but there is a huge potential implication of that. So Davina Allen argues that nursing work is everything nurses do, and it's not only patient care. And this study has absolutely changed. It has changed nursing and is one of the most important pieces of research that's ever been done. And when I was a clinical nurse, I completely took for granted, oh, I have to do paperwork, oh, I have to answer phone calls. But if you don't know how to answer a phone call properly and you don't know how to convince the person on the other end of that phone that you have a very urgent issue and they need to deal with it right away, your patient can be in a lot of trouble. 
So this example of ethnography involved observations, looking at nurses' experiences in a culture and how each individual person contributed to the overall running of the healthcare system. And so that's an example of how ethnography takes like a wide angle lens on a given culture. All right, phenomenology, experience, grounded theory, process, ethnography, culture. Interpretive description looks at explaining how something works. So that is how you tell the difference between the different food groups, if you will, is looking at how you answer different types of questions with these different methods. So interpretive description is a made in Canada research approach. It is um, kind of the new kid on the block, but it's very up and coming in nursing work. You build an analytic framework based on your prior knowledge. So rather than kind of wandering out into the wilderness and saying, I'm gonna just start from scratch and find out what I know. Um, interpretive description really takes ideas you might already have from your clinical practice where you, and it gives you an opportunity to make sense out of them and explain how something works. So this often uses theoretical sampling. And so what that means is you want to come up with some ideas about maybe this is how I would explain how something works and then test them by talking to people and asking, what do you think of this? What is your theory on how this works? This is different than hypothesis testing that happens in quantitative research, but this is a way of looking at interpretive description to say, how can I understand how something works and how can I build on that understanding little by little as I collect data? So um, this is another one of my studies. And so this is work I did looking at different types of work that nurses do. So I wanted to explain how nurses do different kinds of work and what it is that we actually do because we give medications, but we're not pharmacists. We can assess and create care plans, but we're not physicians. We can help patients mobilize, but we're not physiotherapists. So what is it that we do that nobody else does that makes nursing unique? So this is what I came up with. So my explanation for how nursing work works is we have clinical work and that is looking at how care um, occurs with people who are patients, clients, residents, and the people who are important to them. So clinical work is kind of the most obvious, most visible kind of nursing. It's often the kind of nursing that everybody thinks of when they think of a nurse. However, it is not the only kind of nursing. There is managing work, and this is something that Florence Nightingale tapped into, but kind of got lost um, along the way. And it's an idea I want to revisit in that nurses manage the context of care. And this is something we do that no one else does. So we make the healthcare system run. So for example, if I, when I was working on a unit in a hospital, I would call and order towels. Now, maybe those towels weren't for a specific patient. Maybe we just ran out of towels and we needed more towels. So I would phone and do that. But that action I was responsible for that action because I stayed in one place and I would need to use those supplies in that environment. For example, physicians, they go all over the hospital. They see people, see patients in um, the emergency department. They see them in intensive care. They see them on the ward. They see them in outpatient clinics. Physicians go everywhere. They ping pong all over the hospital. However, nurses stay in one place. So we are responsible for making sure that one place is working. So that's why we are the people that call for towels. We are the people that check the fridge temperature. We are the people who make sure that we have all the beds we need, like the physical beds, and we make sure we have enough staff. This is all managing work. And this is the work that makes the healthcare system run. And nurses are the only ones who do this. This, isn't, this is our responsibility that is unique to us. 
And so because of that, that is helps fit the nursing role into the overall picture of um, what it is that we do. The final category is one that I find myself in now, and this is enabling work. And this is work that sustains the healthcare system. So research, education, policy development, leadership, um, work in a union or a professional organization, that all sets everything up. It enables the managing work and the clinical work to happen. So this is why I see myself as just as much of a nurse as somebody who works in intensive care is because my job fits into this set of work that makes up the nursing contribution to healthcare. And so if I don't do research and if I don't do teaching, then we have no knowledge to draw from and we have no education for the next generation of nurses. And without that, we're not going to end up with people who provide clinical work. So that's how all of this work comes together to ensure that we get safe patient care. So obviously something I'm very passionate about, but I hope that you can see that what I have done with an interpretive description is to explain and interpret and describe what nursing work is. So I have three related categories here that are all connected in an explanation of how nursing work functions, how it adds to the healthcare system. So I'm not talking about experience or culture or process, but rather I'm explaining how something is working. Um, I did this research um, with interviews and interpretive description studies can often use interviews. But you can also have documents, you can sit in on meetings, you can do all kinds of different things. So this is a really popular research method because it's one of the most flexible. And so this um, methodology means that you can study a lot of different types of issues um, and look at them from different angles to explain how they work. So we've given a very brief overview of what um, different key methodologies are in qualitative research. And so when you are appraising these studies, you want to think about, do you have good alignment between the methodology and the type of thing that you study and then the usual methods? So as I said, this is important. I keep going over it because it's important. Phenomenology studies experience. So you're going to talk to a small group of people probably several times to really understand that experience. Grounded theory looks at a process and how does someone move through an experience in time. And so you're probably going to speak to people through interviews for grounded theory. Ethnography looks at culture and so the primary data collection method there is observation. It's maybe not the only one, but it's the primary thing. Interpretive description, you want to explain how something works. So you might look at a given problem or a given situation and say, how does this work? So you might have varied types of um, data collection methods, but they all funnel into that explanation. So if you were reading a paper and it says it is a phenomenological study, but it's studying culture and they're using observations that doesn't line up. So that is a quick clue to say something isn't right here and you need to be a little bit on guard as you're reading that research because maybe there's something there that's going a little bit wrong. Or, you know, somebody says they're doing an ethnography, but they've done no observations at all. They've only done one interview with three or four people then I would also be concerned that maybe this research wasn't done with a really good understanding of the method and therefore maybe I don't trust the results. So when you're praising, you're trying to say, do we have good alignment? Do all these things match up the way I would expect them to? And that way you can say, yes, this is a good study. There may be some limitations, but I'm going to use this information when I go to my next shift as a nurse. 
In other cases, you might say, you know what, something here is a little bit off. I don't think I'm going to change my practice yet. I might try and find more information. Or I might say, you know what, there needs to be more research before we make changes in how we work day to day. So this is very important because this can have a big impact on patient outcomes. And we need to make sure that before we make changes to how we do things, we're doing so with information that is done ethically, done well, and that it's going to lead us to good outcomes. So please take time to review. If you're in my class and watching this, you can um, review this table. This is really important in terms of qualitative research. You want to know that qualitative research focuses on understanding and looking at something through the eyes of the people that live it. And then these are some of the different um, food groups, if you will, of what those types of qualitative methodologies can be. And we'll wrap it up there for now. Thank you very much.